All right. So I'm going to talk about uh, some usable security studies that we've been doing at Carnegie Mellon. Um, the series of studies that I'm talking about today is a collaboration with a bunch of people. Um, my student, Kristen Bravo-Lillo, um, is, is the lead researcher here. Um, my colleague, Julie Downs, and other students, Saranga Komandori and Manya Sleeper also helped. And we collaborated with two um, folks from Microsoft Research, Rob Reeder and Stuart Schechter. Okay, so uh, the focus of, of this particular project is looking at these kind of uh, warning dialogues that pop up on computer screens. And I'm sure you've seen these before and you know exactly what they say. Um, and uh, the, you know, the problem with these warnings is that this is in fact exactly what they say to, to most users. Um, and so um, the, there's a big question about the effectiveness of these types of dialogues. And so we're very interested in trying to understand better um, what users see and think and how they react to these sorts of dialogues and how we can actually improve them. Um, there's a lot of security dialogues that it, uh, in software that's not specifically security software. So just the, the operating system uh, has these sorts of dialogues. A lot of applications uh, have security related dialogues for actions such as downloading, installing, executing, privilege escalation, macros, and authentication. Um, and the idea behind these dialogues is that instead of the application or the operating system making a security decision, um, they want to get input from the user so that the user can distinguish whether this is a dangerous situation or a not dangerous situation. And a good dialogue is going to help the user do that so that the user uh, doesn't do anything unsafe, but at the same time is not prevented from doing what they want to do, getting their work done, um, uh, if in fact there's really uh, little or no danger here. Uh, so we uh, wanted to do some user studies to find out uh, the effectiveness of these dialogues and how to improve them. Uh, so we came up with some requirements for a user study. Um, we needed to have a large number of participants, hundreds or thousands of people, uh, because there's a lot of individual differences to how people uh, perceive these things, and we had a lot of different conditions that we wanted to be able to test. Um, so if we're gonna have hundreds or thousands of people, that makes it difficult to have them all come to your lab or go visit them all in their home. Um, and so therefore, we wanted to be able to do this over the internet with remote observation. Um, we needed to be able to observe uh, impacts from some small interface changes. So we couldn't just have people use the software they're already using. We needed to be able to show them things that were a little bit different. Um, we also didn't want people to know that we were interested in security behavior. So we wanted to observe them doing a task that had nothing to do with security, um, where there would be some security dialogues that would come up in the middle of the task. Um, and then we wanted to be able to ask uh, participants some questions after they were done. Um, so it took us a while to figure out how to do this, um, and we designed um, uh, an evaluation platform that would let us, that would meet all these requirements and let us study this. Um, so our platform um, is an online game study. Uh, that, that's the ruse. We're telling participants that they are signing up to evaluate online games. Um, we do this over Amazon's Mechanical Turk. Uh, so for those of you who are not familiar with that, uh, it's a system run by Amazon where you can post um, small jobs. People can volunteer to do the jobs and get paid 10 cents or a dollar or two dollars to do the jobs online. And Amazon takes care of uh, handling all the payment to participants. Um, we set this up so that we could run many different conditions with different interfaces all in the same study. Um, we instrumented it so that as participants participate in our study, we capture all of their keystrokes, their clicks, their mouse movements. Um, we also can give them an exit survey at the end of the study. And then we can actually reconstruct and play back each user's interactions with our study. We actually have an interface where it's like we can essentially watch a video of what each user did when they participated in our study. So this is what the uh, study looks like, and I'm gonna take you through the whole study. So a, a, a Mechanical Turk user called a Turker would go to their Mechanical Turk dashboard. Um, they have a Turker ID, um, which is, this is the only information that we get uh, for the participants. So we don't have their name or their address or anything like that. We just get their Turker ID, and they can earn money doing this. And so this, this worker has earned $7.20 so far. 
Um, so the Turker will then go and see what jobs are available. They call them hits. Um, and here's our hit right here at the top. And uh, they can click on it and find out what their requirements are. And if they're interested in doing it, they see, ah, this is a, uh, a Carnegie Mellon survey has to do with online games. It will take about 20 minutes. We'll pay you a dollar. Um, so they can scroll down, accept the hit. And then they get to see this link here, which takes them to the study website. Uh, they click on the link, um, and uh, they, they are now entered into the study. Uh, they get our standard consent form that our institutional review board requires that we uh, include. And here we tell them um, that they need to actually read and consent before they can do the study. They have to answer some questions that they're over 18, they want to participate, and now finally they're into the study. And so here we give them some instructions that they need to go to the link that we provide and open the game. Um, the first game is called Mars Buggy Online. They're supposed to play it for two to three minutes, and then they're going to answer some survey questions about the game. Um, we also warn them that this URL is not controlled by us. It's external. Um, and uh, the, the idea here is, is to let them know that, that, uh, that this is, this is, we're taking you outside of the Carnegie Mellon controlled space at this point. So they can go and click on the link um, and go to gametop.com. And here they are, and they see the Mars Buggy game. And they can click to have a new game. And then, basically, they drive this little Mars Buggy around for two or three minutes, and they collect points um, and decide how much they like this game. Uh, so then we, we show them a survey. And first, we ask them, were you able to play the game? And they say, yes. And we ask them to describe it. And this person said, well, it was a game about a buggy on Mars. Um, uh, have you ever played the game before? No. Do you think it was fun? Yes. OK. Um, uh, and uh, then we, we asked them a bunch of other questions about the game. The, these uh, really are decoy questions, but you know, it, it, it lots of questions about the game. Do you think it would be fun for 12-year-olds? Whatever. Um, then we asked them to evaluate another game. So this time, they have to evaluate the Tom and Jerry refrigerator raid game. And here they go, and they move around this cat and mouse, and uh, they get points. And then they go, and they uh, evaluate it again. And this time, they say it's a boring game about Tom and Jerry, maybe fun for kids. Um, and they answer more questions about the game. Now they come back, they get their third game. OK, this time, uh, they're going to go to yourgamefactory.net. Uh, they click on the link. They go there, and uh, they're ready to play the game. Only this time, it says that the game requires the latest version of Microsoft Silverlight. Um, and they see the spinning wheel, and they're waiting for that latest version of Microsoft Silverlight to download. A little while later, um, this pop-up appears um, in their web browser. Um, do you allow the following program to make changes to this computer? And it asks them to type in their username and password. Um, so they go ahead and they type in their username and password um, and uh, expect to play the game. Um, at this point, um, we tell them that, uh, that sadly the game is no longer available and they don't get to play the game. And so then they come back to the survey and we ask them, were you able to play the game? And this time they say no. And we ask them, well, why not? And they said, it asked me to install Silverlight, but it never finished the install in my machine. Um, so uh, then we start asking them um, uh, some more questions that, that are really what we're interested in. Um, you know, as I said, the whole game thing was a ruse here. Um, so we, first thing we asked them is whether they actually entered, they, they had any requests to um, enter their password. And of course, they're all going to say yes. Um, and we asked them what website requested your password. Um, th this, this person says Silverlight. We got a lot of interesting answers there. Um, we also informed them that uh, we had, in fact, captured their password. And we wanted to find out whether the password they entered was really their password or whether they were trying to uh, you know, fake the system out. Um, and so we asked them that. Um, and um, we also asked them some questions to try to figure out whether they, they realized that this password entry box was actually fake. Um, and so we tell them, hey, you know, this was actually fake. Were you suspicious? Um, and uh, they, they can. Um, they, they can tell us why they were suspicious or not. Um, we also asked them uh, some demographic questions here, uh, gender, age, and ethnicity, things like that. Um, we asked them some questions to find out how much they know about computer security. 
So we asked them um, uh, some, some basic multiple choice computer security questions. Uh, we also asked them some questions to make sure they're paying attention. So we asked them um, what the purpose of the power switch on a computer is. Um, that helps us you know, make sure that we don't have people who are just blindly you know, clicking next. Um, then we, uh, we tell them uh, that this was a deceptive study um, and why we, we gave them a deceptive study and we asked them if they were okay with that, if they had any problems to let us know. Um, finally, we give them a code which they can go back to Mechanical Turk and enter to get paid. And uh, we give them our debriefing, which is required for, for our human subjects board so that we fully explain the purpose of the study and why we uh, deceived them. Okay, so that, that's basically how our study worked. Um, we did two studies like this. Um, I'm gonna talk in depth about the first one, uh, which I just walked you through, and then uh, really quickly show you a, a, a variation on that um, that we did. The, the first one, um, the operating system framed in case of mistaken ad identity, and this will be presented at CCS um, by my student, Christian Bravo Lillo. Um, the second one is one that we actually just finished a couple of weeks ago, and it's currently under review. Okay, so the first study, the spoofing attack study, um, the real purpose of that study was to explore the trusted path problem. Um, and in this case, what we were trying to understand was how users distinguish a real password entry dialog from one provided by an attacker. In this case, we were the attacker. Um, this is important because an attacker who can generate these kinds of password entry dialogues uh, can do all sorts of things. They can run malicious software, um, so you can think about the, the fake AV um, scam. Um, they can also uh, use it to change some of the features of your operating system and turn off security features. Um, and they also can collect your passwords and your operating system password might be the same password you have for other accounts and devices. Uh, so Windows has some defenses against uh, these sorts of attacks. Uh, the whole control alternate delete thing, you're, you're not supposed to uh, type in your password until you've done a control alt delete uh, on the operating system. Um, there's also um, some of the, the uh, Windows password entry dialogs actually dim the background of the screen. It's supposed to show you that this is a genuine uh, dialog presented by the operating system. Okay, so um, the research question that we were uh, trying to answer here is what proportion of users would enter their passwords in a spoofed OS window. Uh, we came up with a number of different conditions with different variations on the window. So uh, the first two, um, UAC and Cred UI, are two variations on ways that the Microsoft Windows 7 operating system will ask you for a password when it's actually generated by the OS. And there are some distinctions between those that I don't have time to get into. Um, we also decided that we better test this um, for Macintosh users as well to make sure that we weren't just getting a Windows specific result. Um, one of the difficulties with testing this on Mac users is that um, the Mac um, software installation experience is actually a much longer experience. You actually have to go through a lot more steps before you're asked to enter your password. Um, so we, um, we did two versions of it, one which took you through some of the steps, although we still abbreviated it, and the other one where we jumped straight to the password entry dialog. Now, a, a Mac user might be very suspicious because they jumped straight there. They're used to actually going through those steps, um, but we wanted to see it both ways. Um, we also did uh, conditions that an attacker might think of where they disable all the cancel buttons so you feel like you have to proceed. And so you can see in the bottom row, we removed um, or disabled all of the cancel and X buttons that you see on the top row. Um, so we tried these uh, eight different conditions. Uh, we had a number of different challenges uh, in our study design that we had to work through to try to um, make sure that people would tell us the truth about whether they entered their real password and whether they were deceived. And I don't have time to go into all of that here. But basically, the, the questions that we asked them um, before, we went, if somebody um, did not enter their password, we, we asked them why. Um, there are a lot of reasons that people would choose not to. A lot of people said, I just didn't feel like installing software on my computer. Right? That shows no um, understanding that there was a security issue here. Um, so we wanted to see who actually recognized the security problem. Um, we also wanted to see whether the password they typed in was real or not. So we told them um, that if they typed in their real password, then we, of course, would delete it immediately. Um, and if it wasn't their real password, then we would like to keep it. Um, and so by doing this, we were able to get them to um, have an incentive to tell us the truth about whether it was their real password or not. 
Okay, so in our results, what, what we found is that we have um, four categories of participants. We had one category that didn't actually see the warning. They, they didn't see the dialogue. They, they were unexposed. And that was because maybe they didn't bother to click on the game link or they quit the study early or something. So we don't care about those people. Um, all of the people who actually did see the password entry dialogue, um, some of them entered a password. And some of them told us that it was the real password. Those are the people we're most worried about. Those were compromised. If this had been a real attack, they would have been compromised. Um, we had some people who did not enter a password, but their reason for not entering it was basically laziness, not because they suspected anything. And so those people are oblivious. And we're worried about that group too, because they very well could have been compromised. Um, then there's the wise group. Those are the people who either entered a fake password or they, um, uh, they, they told us we didn't enter it. And the reason we didn't enter it is because we were suspicious. Okay, so we had um, 504 exposed participants in the first study. Um, we did a, a follow-up um, that had another 200 participants. So lots of people, they took about 18 minutes to go through our study. Um, all right, what did we find? Uh, I don't have time to go through all the details, but just to give you an idea, in our eight conditions, you can see that we had about 20% in each condition who were wise, right? So not very good. Um, we had our largest group was the oblivious group. So about 40% or so in each condition were oblivious to the attack. So they could be at risk. Um, and we had about 30% um, in a lot of conditions, lower in the MAC conditions, who were compromised. Um, now, before you say, oh, the MAC users are so much better than Windows users, um, we can't really say that. As I said, we didn't replicate the MAC interface nearly as accurately as we did the Windows interface, so these are not actually comparable. Okay, um, we did a follow-up with just one condition where we got a lot more participants just in that condition so that we could get some statistically sound results. And basically, we have a 95% uh, confidence interval of between 15 and 26% of people um, who we think would be compromised had this been real. Um, and as a comparison, the fake AV attacks seem to um, uh, compromise about 7.7% of the population um, and uh, five percent of people would then install malware. So this is an attack that potentially could compromise even more people than fake AV. Um, we also, in the process of doing this, realized lots of things that an attacker would probably realize about how we could actually have done a better attack if we were really trying to compromise people. Um, real quick, the second study that we did um, was uh, about uh, the uh, security decision user interface. We used the same ruse for this one, except in the second study, we didn't ask people to um, actually enter a password. Here, we just wanted to see whether they would install something, which we told them was Microsoft Silverlight, but could have been malware. Um, we tested nine different variants of a software installation dialogue here. Um, so here was uh, our control uh, condition, and you can see uh, these are the same dialogue. Um, one of them was a suspicious circumstance, and one was a benign circumstance. Uh, if you look carefully, you should be able to spot that the one on the right is the suspicious circumstance. Microsoft is clearly misspelled there. Um, one of the things we found in our piloting is that a lot of people didn't notice that. And so we decided to try to draw their attention to the name of the publisher to see if it would help people actually spot that. So we tried some conditions that looked like this, where we really highlighted um, the name of the publisher. Uh, we also tried some conditions where the user had to act actively do something before we let them install. So the one on the left, they had to take their mouse pointer and slide it over the word Microsoft Cor Corporation. The one on the right, they had to actually type in the misspelled Microsoft Corporation before they were allowed to install the software. Um, okay, so what did we find? Um, we found that using these techniques, in particular the ones that had both a highlight and an obstruction, you had to do something before you could install, reduced malicious install rates by up to 50%. Um, uh, interestingly, some people still fell for it, but uh, not so many uh, when you actually do this. Um, it had a minimal impact on benign installation rates, so it was pretty good, but it does add time to the installation process. So, you know, typing in, you know, the real Microsoft, you know, that would actually take like another 10 seconds in the install process. Um, we also tried some conditions where we just tried rewording, telling people, you know, more firmly that this was bad, and we found that those had very little impact. So let me just wrap it up here. Um, <coughs> 
We had, our, our research has had a number of contributions. Um, the experimental platform itself is a major contribution here. And we have um, ideas for a number of other studies that we plan to use it for. Um, we use the platform now for two different studies, um, and we've uh, found uh, concrete evidence of what the risk is of spoof password entry dialogues, um, and we've also found ways of improving installation dialogues, and we believe that these results are going to be applicable to other types of security dialogues as well. Thank you.